Hello and a warm welcome from a very cold Chicago to today's Tuesday with Lloyd's session. This is our ongoing virtual series of panel conversation with Lloyd's underwriters and their distribution partners in London and the US. My name is Uwe Schobert and I am the Director of Market Development for Lloyd's in the United States. And it's my pleasure to host our session today. Please let me say on behalf of Hank Watkins and our entire Lloyd's US team, how pleased we have been with the reception and attention we have raised with our Tuesday with Lloyd's events. Since the launch in September, 2020, we now have held 11 sessions covering a broad array of topics, all designed to provide fresh perspective on Lloyd's priorities, classes of business written in the market, a new risk transfer solution. Today marks our third Tuesday with Lloyd session of the Q121 series. And the theme for our sessions is staying connected. This means that our foremost objective is to provide you with a platform that gives you insights on the most compelling topics consistently delivered by experts in their respective fields, as it is the case today with our expert panel. As part of these conversations, we also address the perspectives on the landscape of current and emerging risks and updates on the future at Lloyd's, our multi-year journey toward creating the world's most advanced insurance marketplace. As part of our Q121 series, we have started the year with two syndicate showcase sessions, which featured Apollo underwriting in Aegis London, respectively. Today's session, which is part of our class of business focused discussion with leading underwriters from Lloyd's London market, we are taking an expert look at the casualty market via our casualty roundtable discussion. And it is my pleasure now to introduce the members of our casualty roundtable discussion today. The session will be moderated by Sarah Lin, President, Casualty San Francisco with RT Specialty. Our panel members are Ali Timson, Senior Class Underwriter, North American Casualty at AXA Excel. Joe Murphy, Senior Class Underwriter, Head of USGL and Access at Chaucer PLC, and Matt Yeldum, Deputy Active Underwriter and Head of Casualty at Aegis London. <laughs> Please note that we have included the biographies for our panel in the chat box for your further review. Now, before we begin, I'd just like to quickly mention a few housekeeping details. We would like to get a sense of our audience demographics. So if you would, please take a moment to answer the poll question that we posted and we will get to the results shortly. We encourage you, our audience, to submit questions and ask that you please use the Q&A function instead of the chat feature. This will help us to get to as many questions as possible. Please also note that today's session is being streamed live on YouTube and will be recorded, which gives you a chance to share it with your colleagues and clients, and hopefully they can view it later. Finally, a disclaimer. Please note that today's discussion is purely an exchange of information, and we will not discuss any specific policy terms and conditions or any specific claims information. And with that said, we are now coming to our casualty roundtable discussion. Sarah, Ali, Cho, Matt, over to you. Thank you so much, Uwe. So thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate this very important discussion and to kick off the first business panel with Tuesdays with Lloyds. Our goal and purpose is to have an interactive discussion about the current marketplace and how we're all operating under these conditions. It's hard to believe we're coming up on the one year renewal, or I should say anniversary, I'm in insurance mode, one year anniversary of when we all sharply pivoted to a remote work environment. We've learned we can continue to seize opportunities, find business, find ways to grow, even if it's with our kids running around in the background of our Zoom calls or perhaps even on the couch. As Uwe said, please join us in conversation by submitting questions. We'd love your participation and we'll get to the Q&A at the end of the session. So without further ado, let's get this conversation started. Joe Murphy is going to start us off by speaking about the 
current operating conditions and more specifically about the submission flow and how he's managing his day. Joe? Hi, Sarah. Thanks a lot. And hello to everybody who's listening. And um, hopefully you won't be too bored. Um, in the submission flow, I think you know, it's been unbelievable the last year and a half, two years. You know, the slow London has always got a large flow business and it's always a great resource. And so is Lloyd's for submissions from the US market. I think a lot of what's driving the um, submission flow upwards significantly is the what's going on in the domestic market in the States. You know, you have some large carriers that have either gotten out of the business, significantly cut back limit. Uh, some people have gotten out entirely and you've got standard carriers who can't do that business anymore. It's just been very kind of topsy-turvy in the US domestic market. And I think that's driven submission flow even higher. And yeah, there's probably in the last year since we've all been home, people aren't traveling, you know, you're able to get submissions out. There's able to be more of a flow coming in. That's probably part of it, but I think it started before that. And I think there's been a sea change coming with the American domestics that I think is now kind of coming home to roost a little bit. And you know, for us in Lloyd's in London as well, it's been great. I mean, we've always been good for that, but you know, it, it has certainly driven the flow up significantly, um, keeping us all busy, which I suppose when you're locked in, you don't really mind so much. Um, but in terms of managers, you know, I, I tend to look at it, Sarah, as kind of a triage thing. You know, you have to kind of look at who you're getting your business from. Are you getting it from, you know, trusted sources you've done a lot with? And I say that because the submission flow is so high. I mean, I'm speaking only for my team, but, you know, between primary and excess, we're getting 400, 500 submissions a month. And, you know, with a team of four or five people, you can't possibly look at all of that. So we tend to kind of look at a couple of things. Is, is it a key resource? Is it someone we've done a lot with? Do they know our appetite? Are they sending in stuff we can do? And then most importantly, is the submission complete? Because if I have to go hunting for it, if I have to go looking for you know, basic information like losses or historical payroll or things like that, you know, I probably will move on to the next one. And I think it's incumbent you know, for the brokers out there that are you know, getting mad at me at the moment. It's also incumbent on the underwriter to tell us tell you our appetite. If you don't know what I look at and what I think we're good at, then of course you're going to send it in. So I think it is a two-way street. And I think syndicates and Lloyds have always been quite good about that. So that's, I mean, that's kind of how I manage it. And we try to triage it and kind of handle it from there. That makes a lot of sense. How about how you view or prioritize new business to renewal business? Yeah, I mean, listen, every team, every underwriter, we all like to write new business and new business is key. You know, we all get judged on it. We all have goals for that. Everybody wants to write a lot of new business. I enjoy it. You know, it's a new risk, but I, I'll speak again only for myself. The way I look at it is, you know, you have to have a good foundation. You have to have a foundation of your, your renewal book. I don't know an underwriter alive that wants to churn their book year in, year out. And the reason for that is you have a solid base to build on every year in terms of premium coming in the door, but then you get to know accounts and they get to know you. And, you know, you have a foundation, you have a relationship, you know, the more you know a client, and let's be fair, they're buying their insurance for a reason because they're trying to protect themselves for loss. And when that loss happens, they're going to expect that you'll understand that and, you know, you're not going to be punitive. And, you know, we do understand that. Conversely, when we have to make changes, when the market changes and forms change and rates change, we hope conversely we've built that foundation so they'll understand that you know and i think that we you know we all have to have a very honest view as to why they're here and why they buy insurance and if you have that you only get that from a solid renewal book and although we all like i said we all like to write new business i think if you don't have a foundation of your renewal book and look after that you know it's just very hard to manage your results over a period of time sarah makes a lot of sense and Thank you for a perfect segue. You talked about just relationships and how important they are as you manage a renewal and new business opportunities. Ellie, perhaps you can talk to us about relationships in this marketplace and maybe some specific examples that you've experienced and how relationships play a key role in your day to day. Sure, I'm more than happy to do that, Sarah. So as everyone knows, Lloyd's was founded on strong relationships and looking forward 330 years, they are as important, if not more important than ever. You know, we've all had a really difficult year from a personal and professional perspective. 
And I think a lot of us, when we look back, we realize that what got us through was our strong relationships. You know, for me, a strong relationship is all about trust and respect and being transparent and honest and open with your clients and treating them fairly. And, you know, I think we do a lot of that very well and we certainly want to continue to do that. I mean, if, if I think of a specific example, one that springs to mind is an account that we've written for 20 plus years. They came to us, um, they, they called us a week before renewal to explain that they'd forgotten to notify us of a large claim. Now we knew that, that it was a genuine error because they'd taken the time to invest in a relationship with us, come to London every year and spent great lengths at every renewal meeting talking us through all their claims in a very, very transparent fashion. So we trusted that it was an error and we carried on with our relationship. Um, after lots of discussions and understanding that, you know, the reason they were in the market and a relationship with us was because of the trust and the respect we have for each other. You know, one thing, you know, we need to make sure looking to the future, when everything gets back to a bit more normality after COVID, we need to make sure that when we're working from home more and there's less travel and less opportunities to meet each other face to face, we're still investing in strong relationships. You know, I think COVID has reminded us how important they are. And I think we need to make sure that they're at the top of our priorities because they're what make, they're what make us tick. They, they're what makes London, they're what has allowed London to survive for 330 years and be as strong as we are. Good advice, Ellie. We've all learned time and time again, it's the trust and communication that allows us to find the right opportunities and grow. Um, would you have any final um, advice that you'd like to share to how to curate these meaningful relationships? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think brokers have done a great job in general, given how difficult it's been. And I think we all really appreciate the lengths that brokers and clients have gone to to keep these relationships vibrant. You know, I think the main thing, um, and I think people do this already very well, is communicate. Number one, communicate, communicate, communicate. And, and for me, it's all about verbal communication. You know, I, to me, sending an email is all about swapping data, negotiating a risk, setting expectations, is, 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 you know, needs to be done verbally. There's so much more can be communicated on a Teams call, on the telephone. I think we, we miss out a lot if we don't do that and we, we expect a successful negotiation via email. Um, I think also making sure that brokers use the opportunity where they can to engage us with clients. Now, I don't think I've ever said no to a client call, a client meeting, unless I've had another client call already in the diary. You know, as, as much as we can hear from our clients, not just the risk managers, you know, people in the claims departments, you know, product experts that can really delve into the, the specifics of complicated products. You know, we, we'd always like to hear direct from the client. You know, I think that builds an extra level of understanding, an extra level of trust. And I definitely think the best outcomes come from when we're truly engaged with our clients. Joe touched upon it earlier, triaging a submission. You know, the, the simple going through submission, just checking it's got everything it needs before it's been sent across. You know, we always put our renewals first. Um, but when we're getting new submissions through the door, you, you open the email, you have a quick check. If it's not all there, you move on to the next one. I think most brokers do that very well. Um, I think that's part of the process. You pick up the phone, you speak to your underwriter, you set expectations, then you follow up with an email. The email contains all the relevant information and it means we can get back to you in a really quick time and make sure that we're servicing where we need to. I mean, I, th I think they're the, the top things. And I think most, most people do this really well, but you know, I think it's something we really appreciate when brokers go the extra mile to, to help us do our job more effectively. Good advice, Sally. Relationships and communicate. Um, on that same notion, Matt, talk to us about how life has changed for you given this remote work environment and without having the floor of London to transact business as we've all, or as you've been used to? 
Well, thank you, Sarah. I'd, I'd echo a lot of what um, Ali and Joe have, have said already, so I wouldn't want to go on for too long, but um, it has been a massive change and we've all got into routines and rhythms that make stuff happen. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to the view that things have changed forever, um, but there will be some significant differences going forward, but that remains to be seen how much so. Uh, the only sort of real comment I would make is that I think it's incumbent on everybody in the industry to think about the next generation and the level of education, imparting of knowledge and experience um, that they need to be able to progress and develop um, and the relationships they've got to build. And in this sort of weird environment that we're in, um, they're not having those opportunities to build relationships, to have the sort of five minute conversations um, around the photocopier or whatever it used to be in the old days um, and where stuff was learned and you know, soft skills were imparted um, and, you know, stuff was picked up. So that would be my sort of main comment. Thank you so much, Matt, and to the panelists, because uh, no one has a good script on how to navigate this current marketplace. So how to best communicate and to stay on top of this ever-changing uh, marketplace will just continue to help us. So um, before we go into our second topic, which is talking specifically about the current casualty state of the market and then specific information about the syndicates, let's uh, review some polling answers on who is in our audience today. So uh, it appears as though our most widely attended audience uh, member are underwriters at 22%. I won't repeat all of this since uh, a lot of you could see the polling results, but We've got a uh, share of retail brokers at 18%, wholesale brokers at 13%, our beloved insureds and risk managers at 10%. Um, thank you for joining us. Because we've got underwriters as our majority, our next polling question is specific to what Joe and the rest of our panelists were talking about is submission quality. So to our underwriters in the audience, and then respectively to our brokers in the audience, how often to the underwriters are you getting a complete submission to review? 175, 50, 25, less than 25% of the time, do you have a complete submission to review and be prepared to quote? And on the flip side to the brokers in our audience, at what point do you feel comfortable to hit submit and send a submission to your underwriters to review? Same percentages, 175, 50, 25, less than 25. I think this will be telling to see how business flows in our day-to-day. Uh, -day. So the next topic we'd love to transition to is talking about the state of the market and it's no secret we've been in a hard market and COVID has not helped our uh, situation. Matt, if you could lead us off in just speaking to general thoughts about where we are now and uh, maybe a couple thoughts on what lies ahead. Sure, Th thank you, Sarah. So I, I suppose obviously you've got to, one's got to understand this sort of the unusual times that we live in, but. Interesting enough, I don't necessarily think that is the, the main driver of the state of the market from a casualty underwriting perspective. Um, and one cannot deny things have changed. However, I think relatively and comparatively speaking, this market is, yeah, is challenging, but I don't think it bears any form of comparison if you go back to sort of the mid 80s and the casualty crisis. And, you know, not that I was actually sort of doing anything then. Um, but from what I understand, that is the case. So I think one has to be careful to make comparisons. But as a result, I do think that this market will continue to develop and harden in, so, in different ways. And I think we need to ask ourselves sort of questions why that is. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the issues that underwriters face is that there is just so much uncertainty on every level from an underwriting perspective. 
um, and the stochastic nature of the risk environment is such that it is very difficult to predict stuff um, in a way that underwriting was much more predictable and understandable. Um, there are so many uncertainties, be it reserving, be it the nature of the losses um, that one can expect, um, you know, and then you add in the fact that you've got this phenomenon, inverted commas, social inflation, which call it what you want, but it has had an undeniable effect on our business. Um, we see more large claims than anyone could ever have possibly imagined in this industry um, over the last several years. And they have to, I think people would be lying if they say it hasn't taken people by surprise. So you add in that, as well as the uncertainty and the fact late development of claims, you know, it is always under-reserving, underpricing um, that is going to hurt underwriters. Um, so it is, I suppose, also the other thing to bear in mind is the, the low yield um, investment income environment that we live in. It doesn't make casualty underwriting, I hate to say it, necessarily one of the most attractive places to be when there are easier places to make money from an underwriting perspective. Um, so, you know, I, want, I think it's important to understand all of these difficulties um, and why the industry is facing what it is and to expect further changes and further hardening and further strengthening of terms and conditions. Thank you, Matt. Um, would you like to share some specific details about Aegis as a syndicate? You know, how you've been impacted by these changes? Uh, um, yeah, so I, I suppose there was, a, first of all, I'd say that what Aegis was featured last week, so I wouldn't want to bore everyone for too, for too long. Um, we have, um, you know, we write a broader range of specialty classes of business. We have been fortunate enough to grow in the last few years. Um, but I would say one of our key factors is we have not been seeking to bet the farm. Um, we have tried to write a balanced, broad-based portfolio, emphasizing relationships and longevity in terms of what we do. That's a lot of sense. Anything to add about Chaucer or... Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I appreciate that. I, I agree with everything Matt, uh, Matt said about the state of the market. Is you know, there's it's certainly um, hardening and hard in certain places, but not all over the whole casualty market as well. And just for the sake of the record for the panelists, considering I'm the oldest one on this panel, I wasn't doing it in '85 either, Matt. Um, so <laughs> you know, to, just to get that record out for the 200 and some odd people that are on. Um, but yeah, it is. It is a state. It's a state that we haven't been in in a while, and you know the, the market is going up and down, and now it's going up in relation to the rates, and you know it's not all over the place. It's not sorry. It's not um, in just one area. It really does depend upon industry as well, and it really does depend on what part of the casualty book you're looking at. But you know it's been coming for a long time actually, and I think you know every every syndicate has to look at it. Uh, differently and I think the way we look at it in Chaucer is we try to be you know nobody wants to be punitive I don't think anybody in this panel wants to be punitive but you have to look at where the market rates are and what you weren't getting uh, in the past you know and whether or not the rates were adequate and you know the, the rates have been going down for 20 years you know um, and you know we're not trying to get it all back in a year and we're not saying it's going to all go back you know, um, three, four years time, you have to look at where the market is and, you know, be fair to customers. It has to be fair to the insurers. You can't just, you know, absolutely be punitive year in and year out. And I think that we're trying to take a balanced approach. And like Matt, I think a lot of people are, you know, I don't want to regurgitate the same thing, but I think the, um, for Chaucer, for us, we try to write a very balanced portfolio of business. And we have, you know, if you think about the traditional pie chart, you know, manufacturing and service and OLMT, and we're trying to have a nice balance of that. So we're not just beholden to one industry. We're not beholden to construction or manufacturing or whatever. And then try to get a fair rate for what the exposure is. And I do appreciate that there's a lot of brokers out there going, oh, what does he mean by fair rate? I appreciate that. that that's individual deal and it's individual uh, underwriting on the risk. But I think in Matt alluded to this earlier, this didn't happen overnight on the other side of it. And it's not going to be an overnight sensation now either. I think it's going to continue for a while. And I think we have to just, again, be fair to customers and be fair to our own syndicates as well. Sure. It makes a lot of sense. And 
Uh, again, Joe, thank you for the nice segue to talk about what pricing trends are looking like for the next 12 to 18 months. Allie, any thoughts to this? Yeah, I guess Matt and Jay just covered part of um, part of that topic, and I'm definitely definitely in agreement with both of them about the way pricing trends are going. I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty and obviously there's a lot of talk about social inflation. It's a very complex topic and hard to measure, but we do think that it, the likelihood is that the things causing social inflation aren't gonna go away anytime soon. So that's probably gonna to continue to develop and get worse on the back of the fact we've already got some reserve, um, some reserve gaps that we need to make sure we're being thoughtful about. I mean, Joe touched upon it. There is no one size fits all approach. You know, I talked about relationships earlier. The whole point of a relationship is that you try and understand your clients, you try and come up with solutions that are right for them. So, you know, rates I, I believe are going to have to go up because the health of this industry is very important to all of us. And part of making sure it's healthy long term is making sure it's adequately funded. Um, but I wouldn't you know, put, up, put my hand up and say it's going to be X, Y and 10% because you know, I think it's going to vary by insured. You know, we need to make sure we're able to pay claims in 5, 10, 20 years time when clients come to us and ask us to fulfil on our promise. So that's why we need to take action now and probably throughout the next few years to make sure we're in a good place for the future. Uh Completely agree, Ali. And, um, you know, from a class of business standpoint, I'm going to weave in a Q&A question we have with just a great opportunity for our panelists to talk about just what is the classes of business? What are the upticks that you're seeing? And then specific to our Q&A, what are some areas where ENS business into London is uh, being able to find the opportunities and, you know, what are you writing, I guess, is the direct question. You want me to kick off, Sarah? Love that, Ali. Thank you. Okay, I guess from our perspective, we're seeing a lot of everything coming through our door. And I think Joe alluded to that earlier, that he's seeing the same. I mean, if I was going to really pinpoint what I'm surprised we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing a lot of OLT business. I think there's some distress in the US market, given some of the claims that have been coming through on that side of the house. And it's making business that normally sits quite comfortably in the domestic market, look for alternative homes. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, we're also seeing a lot of sharing economy and autonomous business. Um, and I think some of us have different appetites for that. Um, <coughs> we look at the autonomous, but maybe not some of the other classes. Um, we're also, there are some changes in appetite. I mean, I'll talk about us specifically, but we've pulled out of coal mining um, due to climate change position that we've taken. And I know that there are some others following suit with that. Um, I can, the other thing I've observed is that the construction market seems to be slower to change than the rest of the market, but it is slowly but surely catching up. I mean, I don't know what you think, Joe, because you seem to write a lot of that business, I believe. Uh, well, I don't know. I think Matt probably writes a little bit more of that than I do, to be fair. But um, I, we do write, we do write a fair bit, although Ali, you're right about that. Uh, you know, one thing I'd say before I address that, though, one of the things that I'm really surprised at, Sarah, is the the amount of business that I would have thought would be traditional standard market business in the states that now comes to London. Stuff that you know, donkeys years ago when I was underwriting in the States, and again, it wasn't in the Crimean War, it wasn't that long ago, but it was a while ago. Um, you know, stuff that I would have been able to do when I was a standard market underwriter that now is in the ENS world, and now that is coming to London. So that does surprise me. And, um, you know, like and Ali said, the OL&T stuff, I, I have no doubt that's distressed in the States because we get so much of that. Um, but the one thing that has been really surprising to me in the last year, year and a half, is and maybe it's just us, I don't know, maybe it's the brokers who I know, but we see at least 15 or 20 regularly um, discontinued products policies or IBNR cover. We're seeing a lot of that. And we've had some good success with that. Um, and I don't remember seeing that when I worked in the States. So, I mean, it's been obviously, and 
something that's come apart because of the US market and, and insurers are being forced to buy it. I do appreciate that, but that's something that I didn't expect to see. But going back to Ali's point about construction, and I'll turn this over to Matt because he probably has a better feel for that than I do. I think she's right. I do think that the rates are slower to move there, depending upon what it is. I think the more, more senior or the, sorry, the more severe stuff is getting some significant rate. And I think the market is shrunk for people who are right that. But Matt, I could be wrong on that. I think, no, I, I would agree with that. I think that sort of the, the more vanilla um, commercial construction, um, not residential, I hasten to add, outside of New York, um, is probably still fairly easy to place. Um, having said that, anything that has a long period is complex, it's sophisticated, is going to be a challenge. Um, residential is a challenge as well for obvious reasons, given the deferred earnings pattern and the tail and the reserve strain that that brings and the uncertainty that goes along with that. And then New York is uniquely challenging, as we've always known it has been for, for various reasons. Um, so that, I don't, that, that would be my take on construction. Um, in terms of you know, what we, we see a lot of inquiries around transportation related risks and also sort of specialist auto stuff. Um, and I think this is driven very much by the sort of the social inflation um, factor. Auto is one of the classes most exposed to it. And all it takes is uninsured to be exposed to an event in the wrong venue with the wrong fact pattern, with an aggressive and imaginative plaintiff's lawyer. And the awards and the settlements can be stratospheric beyond anything you would have ever thought possible, feasible, reasonable, <laughs> um, you name it. Um, and I think that's one of the other challenges is that the, the industry very often is being, fo is being faced with um, issues around more than just legal liability and tort they're being faced with, um, I suppose, let's just call it brand protection. Insureds so often are wanting to settle because they don't want something to be to go on and on because it just provides, it damages their reputation and their profile so much. And underwriters are faced with issues way beyond just tort and just conventional damages. Sorry, can I just jump in there for a second? Because I think Matt hit on something really key. And I think Ali would have a perspective on that as well. One of the things that I think has surprised me a little bit is leading up into the hard market is the underlying limit required for motor, for auto. I mean, yeah. forever. it hasn't changed. And it hasn't changed. It was literally a million, again, back donkey's years ago when I started, and that stayed forever. And I think if you yeah. look at books domestically in the States and probably London as well, so much damage has been done to people's books, not by the GL, but by the auto getting into that first yeah. layer. Would you agree with that, Ali? Yeah, I absolutely would. I mean, I think that's it's part of the social inflation effect where in 2011, a death claim settled at 2 million, rolled forward eight years, and the average settlement's 5 million. Absolutely. But the attachment point hasn't followed that up. And yeah. so then for the result is the mandate for a higher attachment, even for you to consider the risk. I mean, for me, yes, definitely. I, I won't attach it a million CSL anymore. I won't. I just, just can't, especially on a large fleet. You know, yeah. it just, and it, you know, like Matt said, it never changed. It was there forever for the longest time. Back, I mean, the GL limits years and years ago were half a million, a million on the ag. And that changed to a million two a long time ago, and it's gone to two four. But yet the auto stayed the same at a million CSL. Sure. Yeah. This is a good opportunity to weave in another Q and A question on the same topic of social inflation and um, the catastrophic results. In your opinion, would you say the significant release of some of these lost reserves in the current year has resulted in perhaps a more punitive pricing increase? There's no science to the answer, but opinions on, you know, did the sharp pivot create too sharp of a result? Is it too soon to tell? I I'd have a quick start. I, I'm not sure. I don't necessarily think that the reserve releases have driven 
um, market behavior and but I think they are a, a byproduct of it um, and one needs to be very very careful as an underwriter to play games on reserve releases but I think the I think the issue that's driven the excess market it more than anything is payback and sustainability of book um, if if you take the notion of a, an excess writer with a say 15 25 million dollar risk line and they're writing 30, 40, 50 million in premium, um, attaching excess of a minimum, I don't know, say 10 million, they can't afford to pay one loss when you factor in everything else, expenses, reinsurance, cost of capital. And um, that model is now bust, in my opinion. Um, and I think people are therefore looking at smaller lines, smaller exposures, a differently balanced book, which is much more focused on payback. Anyway, I, hand over to the other to Ali and Joe. Ali? Yeah I, I think Matt's kind of hit the nail on the head there really with what he said I mean I don't I don't think it was a con you know I don't think there was a specific reason that happened other than it needed to happen um, and I guess you know long term we're just we're, we're trying to make sure that our books um, are sustainable for when we you know we're going to get our insureds claim in 20 years time on a 2021 policy year we need to try and look to the future and make sure that we can pay that claim and and to matt's point you know i think everyone's reduced capacity because there's much more volatility and you know and, and yes you can increase pricing but you also need to do other things to try and make long-term change to make sure that you're sustainable and, and I also think, and I also think as well, Sarah. To be fair, I think you know they both hit the nail on the head as well. But I think you also what some people forget a little bit is you know we all of us underwrite in different syndicates, but we've all got reinsurers as well. We reinsure, you know, our books, whether it be treaty or fac or whatever. And it is a bit of a domino effect because if the results are poor, you know, you're going to have a reinsurer that's going to be affected. That will, you know, I mean, we pay increased rates for our reinsurance as well. And, the stuff that you know like my treaty just renewed and you know we got it done and it was grand but you know prices are going up on that end of it as well and if you've got to go pay those costs as well you've got to manage that with the book and the limit you're putting out and you've got to buy the reinsurance for that limit and th it all kind of goes hand in hand with the results i agree with matt i don't think it was the reserving at all i think it was results and i think results have been coming for a while and other carriers you look at a couple of the big carriers in the states their results have not been great. And conversely, what have they done? They've cut their limit back from 50 to 10 to five in some cases. And I think that was a long time coming and has driven the rates. Of course, I'm an underwriter, so I'm never going to say the rate increases are punitive. I think, I think people need to, you know, I come back to payback. And if I was to explain a lot of these contracts to people not in the industry, and I'd say, okay, there's a $10 million line at a, at a rate of a thousand per million. That's not a very good bet. It doesn't matter how good the risk is, um, yeah. you know, you're not going to go to the bookmakers and and think, yeah, well, okay, that's a that's an even bet one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, so with the you know U.S. social inflation issues and continuing with these you know huge payouts, what are your thoughts on it being replicated into the London and European markets? I think, well, sorry, I'll, I'll just kick that off to start. I, I think it's already started. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, um, a lot of that moving around the world. It's, you know, it's, it's obviously, I realize we're all at home now, but it's a very global world. We, you know, we're in each other's backyards, back pockets all the time. And I think that the social inflation that comes out of the States is going to, is already migrating. If you look at what's going on in Europe and then the Asian market as well. I think it's just a function of, of the way the world is. I mean, maybe the rest of the world isn't still as litigious as it, as it is in the US, but it's certainly, I mean, Matt, you've worked in Lloyds longer than me. I mean, I think it's getting that way. Yeah, no, there are there are other territories that are equally challenging. Um, you know, certainly Australia, the UK, parts of Europe, Latin America, and you're dealing with the jurisdictional uncertainties in so many of these territories <clears throat> as well. Um, and that's very hard to very hard to underwrite. Yeah, I guess one one thing I'd add to that, I mean, I completely agree with what Joe and Matt said. 
I think one of the things that's speeding up social inflation and third party litigation funding is also you know, these companies are global companies and they're providing the funds for litigation in all sorts of territories, not just the US. In the UK, if you Google it, the UK, you get hundreds of pages of firms that are providing that funding, which means that more cases will go to trial and more cases will, will be fought longer. And it, same as in the US, the inevitable outcome is that settlements will be higher. Uh, that's a very good point, Ali. Exactly. You know, we've, yeah. we've seen that on a global basis for sure. Absolutely. Uh, we are opening to, I know I weaved a few Q&A questions already as it seemed appropriate, but um, to increase, and we love the participation to the curiosities of our audience, please feel free to ask questions into the Q&A as we are gonna try to get to them all. Um, this is an interesting question here about, you know, Truly, our business is on the foundation of relationships and communication, as we've spoken about before. But there is a wave of electronic trading coming into our space as well. And any opinions about the impact from the day to day, whether today or into the future? I'll open it to the panel. I mean, I, I think it definitely has a place mm -hmm. and it definitely can be useful. I think it's about finding the right platform mm -hmm. and about building it with participation of brokers and underwriters to make sure it, it provides benefits. Yeah, I think there'll always be a place for face-to-face -face negotiations because complex risk requires that to get good outcomes. But a good trading system can provide efficiencies, which is good for everyone. So, Just my two pennies. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I think Ali's right. And I think, you know, as the as the market has evolved and, and technology's got up, you know, with that, I, <clears throat> there's certainly a place for that. And I think what Ali was saying as well about the complicated risks, you know, obviously I come from that generation of, I prefer the face-to-face. -face, and I think that it's too easy for, it's easy for brokers to just kind of email a submission and it's easy for an underwriter to just decline it if you never see each other. And I think, you know, one of the things that COVID, and I think Matt touched on it earlier when we started, that all of us being home, you know, you don't get that training anymore. The younger people, the younger underwriters coming through and the younger brokers aren't being shown how to broke a deal and how to underwrite a deal. Sitting at the box, or Sarah, like you guys traveling all over the States and going seeing people that kind of soft skill is really important. And if you have a large deal or a complicated deal, it's very, I think, almost integral to, to sit together and go through it and underwrite it and talk and look at it and ask your questions. And I think you lose that online. Again, I think it's easy to just decline it and, or it's easy for a broker to just go, ah, I'll put an attachment on there. And I do think you a lot in there. I'm not saying it, you would write something, you wouldn't write something because you just got it electronically. But something is lost in translation. And I think COVID has shown that in the sense of the younger people that are getting trained. It's so hard to train people on a Zoom call. It is. And so I think I take that into the underwriting broking world. And I think that, that, that would be lost. If that's lost, that'll be a shame. I would agree. Uh, as a broker, I think the narrative to each opportunity is very telling to the opportunity and how it's viewed and underwritten and how to best find solutions. So while there is a place for electronic trading, there will never be the replacement of, um, you know, the intelligence or the, you know, actual class knowledge that all of us are able to bring. Um, so I'm going to transition to our next question, an interesting one. Um, does the panel consider the continued provision of occurrence coverage sustainable? And if so, how do you feel this may impact future profitability? profitability? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think my own personal view on occurrence versus occurrence reporting and claims made is, is much more about the underlying risk than anything else. Um, there, are certain, there are certain risks and exposure we would never consider on a, a loss occurring form. But conversely, there are a number of risks that we're perfectly happy with. 
um, to look at on an occurrence form, especially the non the more non latent risks. And indeed, if you've got a claims made policy with a historic retro date, you are in essence renewing that historic exposure year on year, which is a challenge, a unique challenge in itself, and something that can provide some really nasty surprises if you don't sort of watch out. Sure. I think 100% agree with that. I think anything with latency, you're going to want to have on a claims made or you know integrated occurrence form. I, I everything you said, I agree with that. Very kind of you, Joe. <laughs> well, we we very rarely agree, mate. So it's kind of nice yeah. for me to see this. Indeed. So, what keeps you guys up at night? I like this question. Some of these emerging risks and issues. You mean something other than Netflix? Um, uh, you know, I, for, for me, it's just the flow of business that's coming in. You know, uh, it's just the stuff that's coming in. I mean, there's obviously all kinds of issues. Cyber is an issue that I know Alex is all too well aware of. Um, you know, we chat a lot about these days and, you know, terrorism and all that. But I think for me, the, it's just the flow and where the market is going and being able to service it. You know, there's a lot coming out of the US at the moment. And I think, for us, it's just trying to be able to manage it effectively and stay effective it's in this very weird way of working. For me, it's a lot of it's around the uncertainties and the uncertainties we deal with in terms of managing our book. And in that respect, you know, you go beyond the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, but it's, it's, it's the perennial issue as well of under-reserving and underpricing, um, and late movements and, that's why liability business can be so challenging. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's the same old concerns, to be honest, they're just heightened at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with what Joe and Matt said. You know, it is, it is what we don't know that we worry about, but we can't worry about it because we don't know. But I guess there, there are some things we've been monitoring. I mean, deep fakes is something we've been talking a lot about internally. You know, where will that end up? Joe touched on cyber, you know, is, is that a potential issue um, for the market going forward in this relating to cyber? Um, you know, I guess some of the other emerging trends that we're watching sunscreens, 5G, you know, but, but again, it's, it's often the thing you haven't been watching that's the thing that creeps up and bites you. So just, anything, anything with exposure to the general yeah. public. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how about it just in terms of managing just capacity and how to participate in top That's an emerging issue that is constantly on all our plates. Specific examples or thoughts around this? Could you repeat the question, Sarah? I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I couldn't hear you either. Sorry. Just in the umbrella space specifically, it is difficult to find capacity. Do you find, I guess I'll reword it, a lot of opportunities in figuring out where in a tower you can participate and how to best manage that process? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. I guess one of the things that's interesting that you look at the market at the moment where, you know, if you look at a large tower, we are seeing, at least I've been seeing in the last few months as well, people who used to buy three, 400 million of limit are now buying maybe 100 or 200 because of the price and they maybe can't afford to buy the tower and again speaking again only from my own experience we are we are having a bit of a luxury in the sense that we can we can pretty much say i don't want to play on that layer i i, I want to play at 50 i want to play at 100 and you know we there's a bit of luxury about that which didn't exist a few years ago i think it's in, in combination though you don't want to price the people out of being able to afford their layer their tower but you have to get a comfort level for where you're willing to sit on a risk that is more hazardous than maybe you would want to play down low. It's a balancing act that really isn't changed by the market other than what's going on with people being able to afford their towers anymore. Yeah, we, I, we, you know, I, I suppose it, I'd look at, we look at it slightly differently. We are not conventional excess um, capacity writers and we do look to write at lower levels of attachment. Um, but you know, it's ultimately it's our availability of capacity is driven by the profitability of the book, 
the availability of reinsurance, um, the cost of capital. And it, liability insurance is a very capitally intensive business because there is so much capital um, required to support the level of reserves that you build up over time. And it sounds counterintuitive, but the more you reserve, um, both in terms of known losses and IBNR, but the more capital you have to carry. Um, and that's why it is not as easy a game as writing short tail classes. Um, but I would also say that I think, you know, we've seen a lot of this in terms of clients buying less because they say they're only going to spend so much. I think they need to be careful because ultimately they need to be sure that they're, you know, they've got the say so and the approvals within their own organizations to sort of buy less when they perhaps could have bought more by spending more. If the loss happens, you know, what situation does that leave them in um, from a litigation perspective with counterparties such as shareholders? No, I, I agree with the other two. I guess I'll just add from our own perspective how we like to play within a tower. We normally like to put capacity throughout a tower and ventilate. I mean, obviously that's subject to getting the right price for capacity. Because as Matt said, it's all about obviously making sure you're getting the right returns. But it has been a challenging year because, because you can't necessarily um, decide in advance where you want to play because there's so many moving parts. And obviously it's a two-way conversation. Where does the client, where would they like us to participate where, versus where's our sweet spot? Oh, very good um, input. Thank you. So an emerging risk also that we face day to day is captive arrangements. Are you finding a lot of opportunity or how are you coexisting with captive opportunities? Is I mean, we see captive, uh, we see some captive business come in, uh, not a lot to be fair, in the space that we play in in Chaucer, but I mean, we see a lot of that on the underlying, uh, a lot of that out of Bermuda. Uh, the Bermuda market does does do a fair bit of that. And, you know, it really depends on the individual risks, Sarah, and whether or not, you know, obviously we have to get the information on the captive and, can, you know, we have to be able to underwrite them as well. And we have to, you know, that brings a whole other financial element into it about, you know, the limit, the paper and all of that. But certainly, you know, that, that certainly has a place. And I, you know, I, that wouldn't stop me from writing a risk, but there's more to it and more analysis we have to do to get to comfort level with it. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd go along with that. Um, so are there any modern, this is, this, um, the questions are so wonderful and thank you for such uh, insight. I don't know that we'll be able to get to all of them. So perhaps two more to wrap up our session and then some thoughts from our panelists. Um, the question that I think is interesting is, you know, are there any differential modern types of data that you would, that would help you better underwrite a risk? Anything new that you can see to get through submissions quicker or find better solutions? Um, I think quality of, Quality of um, loss information is just so important and triangulated, ground up individual claim, you know, the more the better because, and there really shouldn't be an excuse for not being able to provide that. It is an important part of any client's intellectual sort of property. Um, and, you know, it's a really valuable, it's really valuable for them and they should seek to mine it and work with it and use it from an analytical point of view. Yeah, I agree with Matt. And to tie into something, one of the questions from earlier, to Matt's point about loss triangles, you know, if you've got really good data about how claims are developing, you can be comfortable providing coverage under the current trigger because you have the data to back that up. <clears throat> so the more and better quality data from that perspective, the more comfort we can have that occurrence is the right trigger and certain risks. Even if it's something we might be more nervous providing that trigger, if we can get comfortable with the data, we may be able to be persuaded. Yeah, sadly, we don't always see that great. <laughs> the, the, the loss information isn't that great. 
And that, that is, I think that's the biggest frustration, Sarah, sometimes, you know, to be fair, when everything is electronic in terms of the, the information we're getting. And um, Matt and Natalie are 100% right. You know, getting quality loss information is currently valued. I, I just can't impress upon how much use that is for us. And if we can't get it, we just can't pull the trigger. Um, you know, and I think, to be fair, it, it's basic information. We should be able to get that. Sure. So to come full circle, part question, how often are you getting invited to do Zoom calls with your broker, even perhaps even your insured, to create a relationship and find different ways to relate? All the time. I mean, I think, the, I'm sure Ali, you're doing the same as well. I mean, we do these daily and you know there's always a zoom call or a team's call with somebody and they are helpful I, I think in this environment to stay in touch yeah i mean i think you know every client that would have come to visit us we're doing a zoom call and more um you know i think it's it's obviously very fundamental to the to, the, to replacing transactions transacting business sitting opposite your broking partner, you have to do a Zoom call. We, we are getting a lot of requests, including some at seven, eight, nine at night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it just, it just forces me to have to clean my kitchen a little bit more often. <laughs> They're seeing it, but that's all right. No, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. and I, But I sadly don't think it is it is a match for the face-to-face -face discussions oh, yeah. with with brokers and clients. And, um, you know, I think we are desperate to to get back to some of that before too long. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're all facing unprecedented challenges in such uncertain times. We're fortunate to have such a vast for support, different ways to find solutions. Any final thoughts on insights to what lies ahead, but most importantly, how we can continue to work together and find the best solutions for our customers and clients during these tough times? She's going to go first. <laughs> I mean, oh, I guess, you know, I've kind know. of said it before I bored everyone with it but for me it's all about relationships and communication you know no matter what happens in the next year whether we're working from home or not we need to keep communicating with each other and just making sure that we're open transparent and looking to treat each other fairly and when we have difficult messages we need to make sure we're doing it over a zoom call on a team's message direct to our client so we can hear the feedback directly so we know how it impacts them so we can make sure that the way that we're treating our clients is with complete openness and transparency. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that, Ali. Um, I think my sort of top tips would be make sure, especially you know, clients and brokers, make sure you're managing expectations and make sure you're understanding from your underwriters what their intentions are with regard to renewal treatments and everything else. And in the same vein, I think, a lot of people fall into the trap of making the submissions to investor relations focused. They need to be underwriting based. Um, we're not that clever to understand what the investment bankers look at. So, you know, let's actually sort of let's make the submission something that is useful to us from an analytical underwriting point of view. I also think underwriters have a responsibility as well. If, you know, I think if, to touch on what Ali was saying as well, I think if we know we're going to give a tough message or if we know that it's going to be a tough renewal for us, we have to say that in advance. You, have to, you can't leave people to the last minute. You know, it's been a couple of times in the last year that I, well, before we left Lloyd's, when people would come to the box and they would get noticed literally seven days before a renewal date. Oh, I've lost this layer. I mean, that's, that's just not right. You just can't treat people like that. I think if we're going to get off the layer or we're going to have to change the price, it's a two-way street. It goes back to Ali's point, and she's completely right about communication. You know, we would want the broker to tell us about a big loss. If we have an intention of raising our limit or, sorry, cutting our limit or raising our price, we have to tell them. And particularly if we're going, we're going to get off a risk, because that's how you build the trust. And that's how you get consistent relationships over time that hopefully bring you business. It is a two-way street. I mean, if we get 
a rubbish submission, okay, that's bad. But if we don't tell them either, we're just as bad as what then if we're, if we're going to make big changes. Makes a lot of sense. Well, again, thank you so much for such an awesome and meaningful discussion. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uwe, I will turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you so very much, Sarah, and uh, everyone on our panel. It was clearly uh, an hour that went by really fast. We could have certainly continued on and tremendous uh, job, Sarah, for moderating the, san the, the panel. And uh, thank you very much, Ali, Joe, and Matt, for all of your really great insights and the expertise that you shared. I think this was a perfect example of the quality of our class of business focused discussions. And all of you as the market experts has certainly helped to put a really good exclamation mark around that. And it's also clear uh, from your conversation that Lloyd's is playing a strong role in the US casualty placements. And it's good news to hear that the market is responding uh, and supporting our broker network and policyholders. So please pass on the word and join us for our next Tuesday with Lloyd's session, which will feature a reinsurance roundtable and it will take place on February the 23rd. So thank you again to one and all for joining us today. Have a great week and we look forward to seeing you and your colleagues for our upcoming Tuesday with Lloyd sessions. Thank you very much and thank goodbye. You. Yes. Thank you.